rev match down into third at 50 miles per hour. And the engine's just like, yep, love the revs, love the revs. And again, that's from third gear at about 13 miles per hour. And I wouldn't have dared just put my foot down previously. But now, come on. This lovely chap is AC Dot. If you live your life around minis, you may well have heard of him. And today on Twin Cam, he's very kindly offered his services to me and my little Austin Metro in an attempt to educate, really. There's a perception that old cars cough and splutter, that they struggle with emissions, and that's just how they are. But as you'll have seen from that little teaser, he's about to commit wizardry with an A-Series engine and an SU carburettor. Because not only will this little red nugget run spectacularly well once he's done, but when I took it for an MOT, it burns so clean that it would pass a catalyst emissions test. Before being graced with the great man's presence, I decided to make a modification. For any of you following along with the mini project of this car, I pulled the engine out last year to have the gearbox rebuilt. And in the process, I decided to upgrade to a twin box Manaflow exhaust. However, because of the Siamese port nature of the A-Series, that means I also had to fit an MG Metro inlet manifold, which meant the factory airbox wouldn't fit, so I replaced it with a cheap and nasty cone filter in haste. Unsurprisingly, I found it a little loud, so I'm replacing it this morning with the considerably freer flowing airbox from an MG Metro 1300. But back to the point, and before we get into it proper, a moment of context. Melody is fitted with a 1275cc A+, the upgraded version of the ubiquitous A-Series engine that was fitted to almost every small Austin, Morris and MG for the best part of 50 years. If you had a Morris Minor, a Mini, an MG Midget, an 1100, an Allegro or a Maestro, chances are it had one of these under its bonnet. In this form, it's fitted with an HIF44 SU carburetor and electronic ignition thanks to its Lucas 65D distributor. So we've no points to worry about. And with that, let's jump in with an investigation. Here's a Metro cold start for you. You see, it starts, it works. Oh, and I will just say, that's how cold it is today. It is absolutely freezing. So the strange thing about Melody is that she's from 1987, and not only does that mean that, yeah, she's got electronic ignition and things like that, but there's also a chance that this engine was fitted with a camshaft from a 998 CCA+. Uh, do you know why they fitted some of them in 998s? Was it a shortage or something? No, uh, there was different specifications of engines. So uh, in order to get the economy on the economy models, they fitted uh, less of a spec camshaft. When I say less of a spec, it was actually, they fitted the 998 cam to the 1275 engine yeah. uh, to get the low speed torque up so that the, the engine will be better and more efficient driving around town. Okay, so it, it was just a spec decision rather yeah. than a part shortage of any kind. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So uh, the engines drive very well low down in the rev range. The only difference is, is they lose out power at the top yeah. end. <laughs> I mean, an A-Series isn't exactly a screamer of an engine anyway, is it? No, but uh, compared to the MG Metro, which would rev on, this one, if it has that cam, definitely won't. But from my point of view, I need to know what cam's fitted so I know how much fuel and I need to put in at the top end of the rev range. Yeah, cool. Um, so is the, I think you said last night, didn't you, that, that you can technically check from the engine number or something? You can, uh, although I don't tend to. Uh, You'd because, rather see for yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, li I like to go to what's, what's actually fitted, uh, because at the end of the day, um, although this engine appears to be completely original, and it most likely is, and we probably could use the engine number, in the vast majority of cases nowadays, these things have all been taken apart, swap, bits are swapped over, numbers moved around in various cases. So I'll just go with what's fitted. Yeah, absolutely. 
So all I'm going to do is choose an exhaust valve and do an exhaust valve check. So this is kind of our baseline before we start messing around with the engine because we want to know what it's actually got within it. So in this case, we'll look at probably number eight valve and we'll check the clearance on it. Okay. And then we'll measure the lift. So gap's too big. So what I might do on this engine is set the clearances anyway. So what I'm gonna do is that valve is completely closed. So we'll take a measurement from there to the top of the head and then we'll open it fully and we'll take another measurement. Okay. Take one figure away from the other and we'll get the lift. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is, if you can remember this figure, in this case, believe it or not, I can't believe that, that's actually one inch. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's not which difficult. Is, I was going to write it down. Which is, it's not difficult which to is absolutely amazing. That's never been the case before. So, so it uh, turns out this car's engine is the best A-series <laughs> engine on the planet ever. It's actually better than what? it was when it came out of Longridge. One inch, exactly. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll move the engine round to the full lift position, and then we'll check that again, which is about there. And we'll take the new measurement. Uh, and we have 714. Well, that makes the maths nice and simple. So we've got 286 hour lift, okay? And if you know anything about your camshafts, the camshaft in this engine, uh, or the camshaft in the 1275 has nominally uh, a about 252, 254 thou of lift at the low, thereabouts, on a 1275. So if you do 0 0.25, let's call it 2.53, okay, split hairs sake, um, minus the follower clearance, which is actually your valve clearance, in this case that's 10 thou, right? And then multiply by 1.2, which is your rocker ratio, you'll get 0.291, uh, okay? Now, if we go to the uh, the Metro Cam, uh, we will have 0 0.225 times 1.2. Right, we've got more lift than that. Yeah. Okay. So what that's telling us is uh, 0.27 is what it would be uh, if you add the, the 998 cam. In actual fact, we've got 0.286. Uh, which is 15 thou more, which is about what you'd expect from having the 1275 cam. So this has got more camshaft than it than I was expecting. Yep. Um, what I'll do is I'll just confirm that with the valve next to it uh, and make sure we've got the same lift. If it's different, then, or if it's majorly different, then, I'll, then we still might have the 9 and 8 cam. The problem with doing this check is uh, there's wear and there's massive tolerance. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so just taking one figure is never a good plan. Yeah. All right, gotcha. so that gets us a start. Now we'll just check the one next to it and see where we go. So, with you know the 998 camshaft, is this something that they changed then, or is it just something that was a bit intermittent? Uh, no, they, they, they fitted that, they fitted uh, in all these cars, uh, in all the Metro series from 1980 to 1990, they fitted, I believe, four camshafts. So, there was Obviously, the standard 1275, I'm only talking about 1275s, but the 1275 uh, had the standard 1275 camshaft, uh, which is what I now think this one is. Um, and it also had the 908 camshaft for the uh, economy versions, like the HLEs and things like that. And obviously, this model in the, in the Mark II. Um, they also fitted uh, the MG Metro camshaft, which everybody knows, uh, for the MG Metros, the Sport 1275s uh, and the Mark II Van der Plaas. And then they also fitted a slightly detuned version of that MG cam for the European market for emissions purposes. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of a halfway house. Uh, so that's quite a nice camshaft uh, because it's a little bit less rorty than the MG Metro and it idles better uh, and you get better emissions, yeah. uh, but it wasn't found in the UK. Mm -hmm. So what I'm now gonna do before I do that other check, I'm gonna continue to go through the valves and just do the clearances yeah. because in your case, there are just 
they all they all appear to be just a little bit on the loose side so is there, is there anything you can tell from just looking at it with the rock cover off um, about the engine, about its health, or is that something that you just can't see at this point? Uh, I could, well, there's one thing that's, that's leaping out at me is how clean it is, okay. right? And that's a good sign because that means it's it's been looked after um, and that means it's had its oil changes. It's had regular oil changes since I've had it, but you should have seen the oil and the amount of swarf in the oil when okay. I first got it. Well, it, 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 as I say, it's looking clean and it's looking like it's had a reasonable life. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly not leaping out to me as an engine that's been fresh. There's, you know, there's. Yeah, it doesn't I know, feel like it. Either. I know, I know you've uh, you've had the engine out recently and cleaned it also, um, you know. But it doesn't look like it's all dry. Yeah, it doesn't leak. It doesn't no, leak. There's no there's no leaks, and that means that the, um, uh, you know, the crankcase compression is is in check. So I've just got round to number eight, which is I've already checked. So I'm just going to move around again. Um, so yeah, it's looking every bit a healthy engine at this moment in time um bearing in mind i haven't listened to it yet so once we get that up to uh up to temperature then that might be a bit different but just to give us uh, an idea what i will do is i will check your gap this is where you have your work checked by someone else and you don't like it <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll just see what size feeder we can get in there Okay, so that's a, that's a 17, all right? Okay. So, yeah, that's a wide gap. Mm -hmm. So um, what we're actually going to find is that will make an appreciable difference already to the overlap lift on the engine, which is basically the amount of overlap uh, when both valves are open. So that will basically make the engine rev, rev a little bit harder. Cool. Uh, also increase the lift by a little bit and obviously the valve area. So what we're doing now will add a little bit to the performance yeah. a little bit more fuel in fuel and air in yeah. a little bit more exhaust out yeah and the ability for the engine to rev just that uh, a little bit higher yeah. as well um we will finish off with the 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 valve lift check once i've gone through the rest of the valve so yeah so that's actually delivering more than 1.2 uh so it's got 1275 coming in no Oh, it's definitely got a 998. Yeah, it's got a 998. Oh, okay. All right. So we're getting 311, all right, uh, versus 286. Okay. So if we if we look at the difference, no. uh, minus 0.26, 15. Yeah, so effectively, what we've actually got is there's a 25 thou difference. Is that concerning? No. Okay, uh, so it is because, within because uh, the cams, the cams themselves, um, the 1275 cam was ground with typically 263 or 265 thou lift on on both lobes. Okay. All right, the uh, exhaust lobe on the 998 cam is 235. 30 foul okay. less nominally yeah. mm -hmm. well we've got 25 foul difference between the two so that indicates to me uh, even after the rocker ratio uh, that we've got a different cam so this is the nine on eight cam okay and that's my that's my final offer as yes. I say. <laughs> so uh, it would be very similar so that would be you know 300 305 versus 311 you know it'd be much closer not okay. 28 not 286 okay. yeah, and yeah. 311 that's that's too far all right so that is definitely uh, the milder cam yeah. all right so, so better for low end better, better for low end so it's not going it's not going to rev okay uh, that's not the end of the world because actually uh, people always get excited about oh i need the mg metro cam and i always say but do you what do you use the car for well, I'm just going out of the shops. We don't need it then, do you? It's an A-series right, engine. An A -series. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, right. they're built to chug along, aren't they? So um, you might also notice I'm not, I'm not changing the rocker box gasket uh, because I'll leave you to do it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I do actually have one. Um, uh, it was leaking anyway. Yeah, it was on my to-do list. Exactly. So I'll leave you to do that, and then that gives me more time to do other things. Yep. All right. There are better, more important things to do. Yeah, there are. Better use of my time, <laughs> as I say. That's no choke, by the way. Sounds better, doesn't it? Much quieter. 
Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, so, uh, you know, cold engine, sounds very nice. Yeah. So it's a good condition motor, that one. So let's have a look at the old uh, coil resistance and see what we got. I should zero the meter. Yeah, I've got the wrong coil on it. I did fear that when I learned that yeah. they want all different coils. I just went and bought one for mini spares and mini sport. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, we, we need to fix that. So we'll put a different coil on it um, and we'll have a look at the plug. So whilst I'm here. So what's the difference between the 1960s coil and this one? Uh, this is basically a lot more power. So um, this is only 0.8 ohm. So with a given voltage, like a 12 volt system, uh, this will drive a lot more current through the through the primary winding, which basically puts more energy into the coil, which basically translates into more spark energy out of the coil. Um, and what that basically means is you're not going to get any more power, right? If everybody goes, oh, more power. Nope, it's not about more power. What it's about is we can light off a leaner mix, all right? And we, we get uh, better part throttle response. So an easier starting. So that's what the core has been changed for. Mm -hmm. All right, so this engine will start easier, run nicer. Uh, and when I'm tuning the car, I can, I can run the mixture nice and lean uh, and not have any misfires. Mm -hmm. All right, so your, your, en your engine ends up running smoothly, uh, produces good power, doesn't have any flat spots, yet it's good on fuel. And do you know what the funny thing is? The best this car ran was before it had been serviced because I went and put a, the wrong coil on it yeah. and I put plugs in it and I, yeah. put all, I did all that kind of stuff. And and there you go. It, 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 I mean, the engine was smoother because it had nice oil in it now, yeah. but it never was quite performed quite as well. Quite as well. And you, yeah. So, so that so makes sense now. It does make sense. So yeah. Um, and that's what people often find is they swap bits over and it's like, you know, I'm sure that doesn't go as well as it did before. And right, do you want to start it up again? Just make sure we're, make sure we're back reporting for duty. You might find it start easy, innit? It's alright, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah, um, I can feel it, it feels better. Okay, cool, turn it off. So I'll just pull a plug out and then we'll do a bit more filming. I suspect we're rich on the fueling. <laughs> Black! Black! <laughs> the colour of death! <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, uh, the reason why I knew it was running rich is because you start the engine up, it's a cold engine. And it just starts. And it starts yeah. and it's running nicely and you rev it and there's no flat bits. <laughs> That shouldn't run like that. <laughs> yeah. It should be uh, fluffy and horrible when it's cold yeah. without the choke on. Mm -hmm. And then when it warms, it should be all right. So uh, you've also got about 15 feet of gap in there as well. <laughs> so um, let's pull them out. It's a, I, you know, I, I remember gapping the plugs when I changed the plugs last on the white car when it was still on the road. I can't remember doing the gaps on this. I remember fitting the plugs, but I didn't even remember setting them. So, from your point of view, if you run an engine rich, it washes the oil off the bores and wears yes. the engine out quicker. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's important that the carburetor is tuned correctly because it will wear your engine out. And a lot of people fall into the trap of winding the mixture screw out to make the engine drive properly. Yeah. And that's not how you tune an issue, despite what people say. Mm -hmm. So we've got you know, 15 feet of gap in there and everything. <laughs> right. You want to get a look at these spark plugs? If it'll focus. There you go. Look at the state of that. Huge gap. And it's very black. Now, <laughs> there is a video on this channel of me changing these a long time ago. Um, and see whether I gapped them in the video, because I can't remember doing them. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Probably not. <laughs> so I don't use resistor plugs. So we're going to fit some non-resistors in. Yeah, you've actually got BPR6Es 
right which basically are the v-groove versions uh, i haven't got the v-groove ones on me today so i've got just got the standard one but it's it's it, instead of bp r 6es it's just bp 6es no resistor so what difference does that make in the way it uh, acts? But basically you get a little bit more power uh, going to the spark plug uh, without the resistor uh, and i like as much power as i can possibly deliver to a spark plug because that means i can get the engine running leaner at part throttle and that's what you want if you want a clean running engine that's efficient so new set of spark plugs and uh, obviously always set the gap before you fit them and what is the correct gap for these uh, the factory will tell you they're 35 to 40. I always go on the 35 there. And that way it gives you a little bit of wear. So it allows them to get bigger. Yeah. So what's that in Roman Catholic? About 0 0.8, oh, 8 or something millimetres? Something like that. Something. Yeah. 0.85. 0 0.9, I think. So before we start this up, Need to lean the mix off because we don't want to sort these. We don't want to ruin these plugs <laughs> before, the, before, before we've even before they've even known life. Yeah. So I should just get my screwdriver and give that a bit of a, a bit of a lean off. Right. Let's go back a full turn. Right, let's try that. Still too rich. Leave it running, it's all right. Oh, there we go. All right, leave. That's better. So let it warm up now. So when the when the engine's cold on a normal carburetor LSU engine, it shouldn't run well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So in future, when you get in it, you'll go. This never runs well when it's cold. Yeah. But as soon as you get down the road, it gets a bit of warmth, it'll be all right. Yeah. All right, and when it's the whole point is when it's up to temperature, it runs fine. Never was good at getting the old uh, clamps on these with the top hose. There we go. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, right. You know you said this was flat. Yes. <laughs> you weren't joking, was you? Right. No, I so we got a very, very flat advanced curve. Okay. So I've just checked the uh, the advanced curve uh, by using the strobe on the uh, the crank pulley, and uh, we've got very little mechanical advance. So we're starting at four degrees at um, basically static, and it's only advancing to eighteen. Um, at 5,000 revs, so uh, we can't we can't continue with tuning like that. So what we're going to have to do is uh, going to have to take the distributor out, and we're going to have to fit a new bottom end uh, with a recurved uh, bottom end to give this engine some punch. Uh, and this would account for why Ed's already said it's just flat. So uh, we found the main culprit. So let's get some timing on it, and then we can move on to the carburation. get caught dangling. <laughs> Don't want to earth out the distributor on a metro because the bat main battery is underneath connection. It gets exciting when you hit that one. <laughs> right, there we go. Right. And that is the original 65D distributor. That is the original 65D distributor. Now, just for the people wondering why we're changing it, the reason why we're changing this is because the advanced curve inside is insufficient to make the engine perform. And you might think, well, what, why is it like that? You know, well, there's a couple of reasons why it's like that. One of which is wear, uh, because it's a clockwork mechanism effectively with springs and weights, and they do wear over time. But secondly, the manufacturer, when they made this car, um, 
they weren't interested in drag strip performance, right? What they were interested in is no warranty comebacks, yeah. okay? And they wanted it to hit fuel economy mm -hmm. figures. So what they did is the, the timing figures to produce good uh, fuel economy are based on the vacuum unit. So when you're running at part throttle, this engine has got pretty much optimum timing for part throttle running. Uh, when you put your foot hard down to get full power, the vacuum drops off and you come back to a, a mediocre advance curve which doesn't let the engine perform. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you drive the engine you put your foot down, it's not stunning. Yes. <laughs> right? Kind of feels flat and wah, makes a lot of noise but doesn't really perform. Let, when you take your foot off it drives quite nicely and it poodles along quite sensibly. So it will drive along the motorway, cruise nicely, drive around down the shops nicely but as soon as you want to race away from the traffic lights, She's not, not having that. She's not having that. So what we're now going to do is make it so it races away from the traffic lights and cruises and idles and does everything it should do and goes when your foot's hard down. Yeah. All right, so that's effectively what we're going to do now. So what I've got with me is a range of dizzy bottom halves. Uh, so we're going to take the top half of the distributor off, okay? Oh, I notice you've got... Is that a damaged thread? No, someone's just left an O-ring in there, okay. It might be on the, the bolt to stop it coming in. So we're going to take the screws off, take the top half off and replace the bottom half, which I'll carry with me. In your stash of many, many thousands in my stash, in, in my stash of things to make you go quicker. <laughs> it's got the original Lucas 9EM type module on it shows you how reliable they are 37 years old nearly yeah and that, that's just a transistor circuit in there and it's still working all the parts are fit when we come to do the tune-ups all the advanced curves they're all mine so I've, I've recurved the distributor if I fit a carburetor I've rebuilt the carburetor so in terms of what we've got here I'm looking at this distributor, this original one. You can see that it's actually got 11 and a half on the base plate, which is, which is right. What we have got that's not right is the weight of those springs. So that's very, very tight, okay? So that's never gonna get full advance, which is what we're actually finding. So that was sprung from the factory to never get to full advance. Yeah. So let's change that one for one that advances a lot quicker and get this engine to wake up. So what you'll see in here is it's been made up out of a different distributor. So it's got 18 written on that one. And then it's been modified with a big stop in it. And then a much lighter primary spring and a lighter secondary. So now I can easily turn that round to the stop and that basically means it swings in a lot more advanced at lower revs and makes this engine produce a lot more torque, which is uh, what's going to liven this up. And then I keep your old one as an exchange. So that goes back and gets recurved. And you go and serve so somebody else's somebody car. Somebody else's car, yeah. So you see, in the original distributor, have a look at the springing in there. It's a really hefty spring, whereas the recurved one the spring is very, very light, and that means that it can advance much quicker, and therefore it actually hit the stop, as opposed to that one that's barely advancing at all. A lot of people forget to put this on with modules. They need to be kept cool. So this is a heat sink compound. Nothing special about it, other than it conducts heat and it ensures that uh, the module can transfer the heat of the, uh, the electricity and the circuit operating inside into the body to conduct it away so it doesn't overheat. And what happens on these is when they get too hot is they simply stop working. So you get left at the side of the road wondering why you've got no ignition and it's usually because you fit the module and you haven't uh, put the appropriate heat sink compound on it. Just like an EC, uh, not an ECU, that's an engine control unit, just like a CPU in a computer. Absolutely. That's it. 
need to make sure when you put that in it engages with the drive shaft and goes all the way into the block. All right, we'll see if it starts. Fingers crossed. What we're going to do now is time it up. Okay. A bit more fuel. Let's smooth it out. That will be sweet. difference yeah mm -hmm. right. a big difference at that big difference yeah <laughs> that's going to feel like i've with two cylinders on <laughs> yeah. yeah in terms of extra torque all right so you're not this is the bit where people say this is night and day mm -hmm. because now your engine's going to feel like it's got a big set of cojones around yeah a little weedy a series yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not a weedy a series now so now what we need to do is continue to let it warm up now we have got some popping going on and yep. the reason mm -hmm. for that is because we've now got a little bit too much advance at idle and that's because this this vacuum there's too much vacuum advance on the idle okay okay and that's because your car is not set up for ported vacuum so if i do that dead smooth yeah right within reason and put that on a little bit too much advance i fear so why would that be like that because the manufacturer wanted to run this engine on vacuum okay we've now changed it so it's got a lot more mechanical advance ah uh, yeah right? i see yeah yeah and we, we you know and now actually what we don't want is really any vacuum advance idle mm -hmm. so in due course you might want to change the carburetor for one that's got ported vacuum which okay. doesn't have any vacuum at idle which means you end up with the car runs nice at idle and runs nice when it's driving. Okay, right. so the moment it's going to be a little yeah. bit iffy at idle, but yeah. fine yeah. on revs. Yeah, yeah. It's only taken us 40 odd minutes, but we're finally breaking into the carburetor itself. The main attraction, of course, being the metering needle. But we'll also sort this piston damper out. So there's your BDL needle, which is good. A little bit of adjustment needed. So now what we've got to do 
very slow drop. Right, doesn't rise too bad, but the drop's far too slow. So now with that engine, when you bang your foot down, it's going to accelerate, and then you're going to want to put another gear in. Well, when you change gear, the piston has to drop to the right position between gear changes. Now, if you go for a quick gear change, guess what? That's still coming down, so it will fall flat. So oh, okay. now what we're going well, to that, do... That makes sense, because if when it was changed from third to fourth, especially, change fourth, then it would just go... It would just... It, it, uh, it, yeah, it, it would... Uh, just on the... It would go... Uh, and then it would go. Yeah. yeah. So we'll get rid of that. Yeah. So just by Joe very gently filing this, is this going to make the damper drop quicker? Yep. So when you're tuning fuel injection, you use a keyboard. Yes. <laughs> when you're tuning carburetors, you use files <laughs> and oils <laughs> and knowledge and know-how and experience. So what we've got now is modified damper. You can see it, it goes up slowly and comes down nice and fast got a quick drop damper that means gear changes will be seamless now and the power straight on once you change gear as if recurving distributors and fine-tuning piston dampers wasn't enough this is where the man really earns his keep there's some trade secret stuff going on here so i'm not showing you in detail but on this mini lathe he's set up he's taken a factory mg metro needle and he's measuring out where in the rev range the fueling needs to be richer in melody's case it's most needed all the way up at around 5000 rpm the needle in an su is your fueling profile low throttle and revs are the thicker section at the top and the point is full throttle high revs. The needle moves up and down through the jet, essentially a small hole, and that is how the fueling is controlled. So as you can see, we've modified most of the needle, not all of it, but most of it. Um, and we'll put it back in the engine now and see what it does. Just out of shot is a sensor reading the content of the exhaust. We'll see it in a moment, but the perfect air fuel ratio is 14 to 1. So a reading over 1 is lean and a reading under 1 is rich. The target is to keep the number as close to 1 as we possibly can all the way through the rev range. That's better. Looks like the airbox on. Nice. Right. So that air filter is costing you a little bit of power. Right. I'm just going to uh, see where the fueling settles down to again. So that's why you have to check it with the air filter on. Yeah. The, of course. Yeah, it will, feed, yeah, it will, I it will feed differently. So that's it folks. I'm sorry that was a bit of a rush kind of conclusion to proceedings, but you know, when you've just got people around and you're doing things, at the end of the day, the be all and end all is not making the video. It's actually the experience of it. It's actually getting my car kind of tuned, but he was kind enough to offer his services to me to make this video, to show people that, you know, these cars can do extraordinary things when they are treated correctly by someone who knows what they're doing. So with that, we are sat here. It's a little while after the event. Um, Melody is ticking over very nicely. Um, yeah, she sounds fantastic. She's not perfect, so I'm not going to like hoon about the place today because I need wheel alignment doing um, because me and a friend changed the steering rack a little while ago, um, which I've not made a video on because I've never really worked on cars on my own without recording it. So. I don't know, I feel like I just want time for myself, experiences for myself. So anyway, with all that, let's just go.
the ease with which she now pulls and just goes through the gears. And it, it, the word that keeps coming into my head all the time, again and again and again, is tractability. Because that's what this car has that it just did not have previously. You know, on a cruise, sat here at 30 miles per hour, it's perfectly nice, it's comfortable, we're sat in fourth gear and we're poodling along very nicely. Can't tell you the revs because I don't have a tachometer. But what I can tell you is that if I slow down a little bit actually, I'm having to use my phone as a speedometer because the speedometer in the car is, it's reading 30, we're doing 24. So yeah, so but if we slow down a little bit, slow down to, and we're in fourth gear here, it's only a four speed gearbox. Let's slow down to 15 miles per hour. Here we are, we're at 15. That's body shell noise, really. And now the engine comes. That's just the body shell shaking because you've suddenly put the engine under all this load, but suddenly we're at 35, 40. And it just pulls so nicely. And now here we are, it's kind of coming on its revs now. We're over 50 miles per hour. And it just wouldn't do that before. This is a 37 year old car with an engine in it that is, I mean, the physical engine isn't, but the design is over 70 years old. People's ideas of old cars is that they are naturally a little bit temperamental and that they need to be driven in very particular fashions. But I have driven cars like this ever since I passed my driving test, but rev match down into third at 50 miles per hour. And the engine's just like, yep, love the revs, love the revs. And again, that's from third gear at about 13 miles per hour. And I wouldn't have dared just put my foot down previously. But now, come on. The valves are gonna be dancing through the bonnet, but the engine's just like, yep, I can deal with that now because it's got the advance, so it's got the ignition available to it. It's got the spark at the right time. It's got the correct amount of spark as well, thanks to that new coil. And the carburetta is tuned to absolute perfection. I, I absolutely cannot describe just how much better this little car feels than it did not very long ago, not very long ago. And that's the other thing about a Metro is it's so easy to heel and toe. I don't know whether it's coming across to you just how much I'm revving the car, but you know, again, I can't tell you the revs, but over 5,000 RPM. And it's an A-series, it's a little overhead valve engine. And, and because the engine is running that much sweeter, Because the engine has this ability it just didn't have before, it makes everything else so much sweeter. The car is quieter than it was before. It's more refined in that it's not shaking all over the place unless you put it under silly load like I did a minute ago just to demonstrate. The gear change is smoother. I think I mentioned this, I just struggled to get into third then. It's still a new gearbox essentially, mileage wise. So it is a little bit stiff still, but the load I can put it under now and the ability to, well, I'll show you. So I'm accelerating, change gear and we're back on and I just floored the throttle then. And that's kind of a cardinal sin with carburetor cars to just floor the throttle because it can't deal with it. Um, but now with that modified piston damper, it can. I am beside myself. This thing is just transformed once I get the tracking done and ignore all this, if you can see it, that's again, because of the steering rack and all that kind of stuff. Once all that's done, this car is just gonna be just different class to how it was before. So with that, thank you very much for watching. If you've managed to stick around all the way to the end, then thank you so, so much. I don't know what um, made you stay around for so long because you know, this is a long video. But thank you for sticking around. Please do click like and subscribe if you haven't already. I have a Patreon. Um, I'm forever indebted to my wonderful support over there. They stick with me when my video uploads haven't been quite so consistent. 
um, over the past few months. So thank you to all of them, you're all saints. And of course, I will have more videos coming along soon. <laughs> oh, silly car. <laughs>